Since Herodotus's account onwards, the Battle of Marathon has become a proud symbol of Greek identity and has been celebrated and recalled by many writers and poets. At the same time, it was taken on by imperial ideologies since Augustus onwards as an image of supremacy over the Persians. This is true in particular for the late antique period when the emperors had to face the Persian threat, that is the expansion of the Sassanian Empire, continuously. During the age of Justinian, the revival of the literary epigram chose among its subjects episodes connected to the Battle of Marathon, just like previous epigrammatic poets had already done. The purpose of this paper is to illustrate the function of propaganda poems that some marathon epigrams from the cycle of Agatias do have, especially because of the influence of official propaganda that is inscriptional contemporary epigrams celebrating the victory of Dara. In particular, I will consider as a case study the use of the adjective medophonos, which conveys the idea of the Emperor Justinian as a new Milciades, defender of Greek identity. The importance and fame of marathon inscriptional epigrams of the classical period is very well known, but the most famous Greek victory of all time was also an inspiration for literary epigrams. In the Planodian anthology, we find some ekphrastic, ekphrastic epigrams that develop themes connected with some episode and characters of the Battle of Marathon. As you can see at point one of your handout, I'm talking about APL 117 by Cornelius Longus on the picture of Phasis representing the dramatic episode of Sinegerus, the brother of Ischylus. APL 222 by Parmenion on the statue of Nemesis or of Ramnus, just like the anonymous APL 263. Or, for example, APL 232 by Simonides on the statue Milciades dedicated to Pan after the victory. <coughs> All these ekphrastic epigrams, included by Planudis in the fourth book of his anthology, take inspiration from the works of famous historians like Herodotus and Pausanias, who report the episode mentioned above. In late antiquity, Herodotus' work was very well known. Themistius says that the Persian wars were taught at school, and the most famous episodes were exploited in particular by rhetoricians and poets as you can see at point two of your handout. The episode of Sinegerus is not absent, no surprise at all, in the model of the new poetic style, Nonus of Panopolis. In the Dionysiaca, he refers to the episode of Sinegerus in book uh, 28, talking about uh, an Athenian warrior without hands. Um, Nonus also refers to Pan in book uh, 27. Uh, let's read the Nonus passage. The god of countrymen himself, lord of the pastoral pipes, Pan the Godherd, needs your aegis cape. He once competed with my unviable scepter and fought against the titans. He once was mountain-ranging shepherd of the god Amalthea, my nurse, who gave me milk. Save the future helper of the Athenian battle, who shall slay the Medes and save shaken Marathon. Um, as you can see, uh, Pan, in this passage, is called Medophonos Iruter. Nonus also takes uh, the Battle of Salamina as an explicit model for its description of the sea battle in Book 39. Uh, some poets, included by Agatias in his cycle, choose the very same marathon themes for their poems, as you can see at point three of your handout. Let's start with Paul de Silentiary, one of the most important authors of the cycle. In APL 118, Paul writes about Sinegerus just like his predecessor, <coughs> Cornelius Longus, in APL 117, quoted above. Uh, in this poem, as you can see, Paul says that Sinegerus has uh, Medophonus Keiras, hands that dealt death to the Medes. We can go further with Tithitus Scholasticos, another author included by Agassias in his cycle, quite neglected, but very interesting because of his seven epigrams, two of which, APL 221 and 233, are dedicated respectively to Nemesis and Pan, recalling APL 222 by Parmenion and 232 by Simonides, quoted above. In APL uh, 233, um, Pan's statue uh, speaks in first person 
and Colts Marathon Medophonos. As we can notice, both Paul and Thesitus use the adjective Medophonos, which was also used by Nonus in the passage from book, from book 27, quoted above. There is, of course, no doubt that our poets knew Nonus's work and cited it wherever possible, for Nonus's poem became a new classic and a model to follow in writing hexameter poetry in late antique period, just like the Nonian style of our epigram shows. Please uh, uh, take a look at the brief apparatus below each poem. Nevertheless, as you can see at point four of your handout, well before Nonus, this adjective was used both by Plutarch in his De Gloria Ateniensium, referring to Milciades, and in an epigram by Lollius Bassus, an author from the garland of Philip, who takes inspiration from the small collection of epigrams on Leonidas' grave quoted by Herodotus. In uh, Bassus' poem, um, the grave, uh, as usual, uh, speaks in first person and uh, says that is uh, the thumb of uh, <coughs> the uh, 300 mid layers of old Tom Potemedophonum Nama Triecosion in the text. So, our epigrams represent other examples of the great diffusion of the events relating to the Battle of Marathon in late antiquity and they have a clearly recognizable literary and rhetorical background. But it isn't just a question of literary imitation and variation of prestigious models. The poets of the cycle choose as subjects for their epigrams these very same marathon episodes, not only for the sake of challenge with classics, as Agatius himself uh, says in uh, one of his uh, preface uh, to the cycle, talking about the aim of his contemporaries in writing uh, poetry, um, but also because of the continuous state of war against the East. This kind of episode took a political meaning and became an image of the fight between the Mediterranean world and the East, quoting Professor Gianfranco Agosti, <coughs> the same meaning that was also true for Nonnus. This aspect was brilliantly pointed out by Pierre Chauvin in a personal suggestion to Francis Vian uh, for his edition of the Dionysiaca. Uh, let's read the Chauvin's words. Ces epigrammes jumelles, that is APL 221 and 233 by Tetitus, témoignent de la popularité dont les guerres médiques ont joui dans l'Antiquité tardive à cause des conflicts contre les Sassanides. Actually, uh, to understand the true value and the, rea the real significance of these poems, we have to consider them along with contemporary inscriptional epigrams celebrating the Roman victory of Dara. The so-called First Persian War of the Emperor Justinian against the kings Kavad and Khusro I took place in the years 504-532. In 530, the Roman army, under the leadership of Belisarius, obtained a great success in a battle at Dara, on the river Euphrates. The Roman victory led to the so-called eternal peace, which confirmed Roman supremacy over the Sassanian, only apparently, since the real state of peace was obtained under payment. Nevertheless, there was a huge effort to propagandize the victory. Justinian commissioned a work, maybe a panegyrical poem or a historical account, to John the Lydian. A statue was set up in the Augustium, a column was erected in the Hippodrome, and so was a bronze equestrian statue of the emperor, on which there were two epigrams celebrating the victory that you can see at point five of your handout. That is APL 62 and APL 63. Let's read them. These gifts, O king, slayer of the Persians, are brought to thee by Eustosius, the father and son of thy Rome. A horse for thy victory, another laurel victory, and thyself sitting on, seated on the horse, swift as the wind. Thy might, Justinian, is set on high, but may the champions of the Persians and the Scythians lie ever in chains on the ground. In this poem, Justinian is called Basileus Medoctonos. Let's read the PL 63. The bronze from the Syrian spoils molded the horse and the monarch and Babylon perishing. 
This is Justinian, one Julian, holding the balance of the East, erected his own witness to his slaying of the Persians. In this uh, <coughs> poem, as you can see, uh, the city prefect Julian erected a statue that is uh, Martyra Medophonon. As we can see, the same adjective we have found in our epigrams, Medophonos, and a little variation of it, Medoctonos, were used by the anonymous author or, or authors of these two inscriptions. Another relevant contemporary example in which this adjective is used is Paul de Silentiary's description of St. Sophia, again at point five of your <coughs> handout. Of, of course, as you know, uh, the ekphrasis of St. Sophia is not an inscription, but we can legitimately consider Paul's poem an inscription-like text because it was recited into the church during an official ceremony a few days after St. Sophia's second dedication in 562. And uh, we have to consider that just a year before, in 561, another peace treaty with Persia, uh, a 50-year peace treaty with Persia, was made by uh, Justinian. That's the reason why we can read a verse like this, St. Sophia 138. Let the glories of mid-slaying works remain unproclaimed today. All these ekphrastic poems were written to celebrate the greatness of the Emperor Justinian and his success against the Persians, and clearly show the overlap between the image of the imperial victory and that of Marathon. They share with literary contemporary example the same use of the rhetorical and ideological tradition concerning the Persian words, as the adjective Medophonos suggests. The literary epigrams included in the cycle were not just written uh, only under the influence of their predecessor, but along with inscriptional epigrams, they contribute to propagandizing Justinian successes, exploiting one of the most popular symbols of Greek identity of all time. Thus, we can notice how a typical Greek model, that of Milciades and the marathon heroes, was recalled in constructing the image of an emperor, Justinian, who didn't see himself only as the heir of the greatness of Rome. Mm, for example, just think about his legal policy. This is one of the aspects of Hellenism reception in late antiquity, the pride of keeping alive the traditional Greek past and Greek cultural and political identity. Greek exempla in that kind of propaganda poems, be they literary or inscriptional, are far from surprising if we think about all the panegyrical Greek poetry of the 5th century, unfortunately lost, that employs comparisons between Greek characters of the might or of the glorious past and their laudandi. For example, think about Ellen Cameron's work on Claudian. The fact that the Medophonos idea, as we can call it, became such a symbol of Roman supremacy over the Persian is confirmed by another later inscriptional epigram, also included by Planudis in the fourth book of his anthology, in the same section that contains both APL 62 and APL 63. I'm talking about APL 46, as you can see at point six of your handout. The emperor, the army, the cities, and the people erected the statue of Nicetas, bold in war, for his great exploits in slaying the Persians. This epigram is dedicated to Nicetas, the general and cousin of the Emperor Heraclius, who led the victorious expedition against King Khusro II. Many statues were erected in his honor in Constantinople, and the triumph of Emperor Heraclius was solemnly celebrated by George of Pisidia, the greatest poet of his age. Once again, therefore, we can see the legacy of the glorious past of Greece recalled to glorify the greatness of its Roman heirs. This is a sign of ideological continuity that connects the early Byzantine period and late antiquity. As I've tried to explain, the marathon epigrams included in the cycle have a clear function of propaganda in divulging the image of Emperor Justinian as the new Medophonos. We can only fully understand this kind of poems if we consider them in the wider horizon of contemporary inscriptional epigrams according to what Avril Cameron said many years ago in her monograph on Agassias. Uh, let's read uh, uh, Professor Cameron's words. They, that is Agassias and his friends, 
were not writing in a vacuum. There was a lively background of contemporary inscriptional epigrams against which their poems must be judged. Thank you for your attention.